Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, you smart people who remembered to change your clocks or who were fortunate enough to have cell phones that did it for you, which is me. Uh, it's good to see all of you this morning. It's good to be together um, in the house of the Lord, gathered by him, our Heavenly Father, um, for this sort of spiritual family reunion that our Father stages every week, in which we're brought together in his house and around his table in order to eat spiritual food, in order to share genuine fellowship, in order to hear the wisdom that our Father has to share, in order to be encouraged and strengthened, um, and in order to be sent out from this place with the warmth of our Father's love and our hearts, with his wisdom on our lips to share, and with his strength as a gift. We're going to begin our service as we always do by listening, listening to the voice of God in his word. Our brother Mike is doing the reading of the psalm today, and as he comes, I ask that you would just prepare your mind and your heart to hear what it is that God wants us to say. When Mike is done reading the psalm, he'll lead us in the call to worship that will be on the screen. The reading day comes from Psalm 119, 57 to 72. Lord, you are mine. I promise to obey your words. With all my heart, I want your blessings. Be merciful as you promise. I pondered the direction of my life and turned to follow your laws. I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. Evil people try to drag me into sin, but I firmly anchored to your instructions. I rise at midnight to thank you for your just regulations. I am a friend to anyone who fears you, anyone who obeys your commands. O oh Lord, your unfailing love fills the earth. Teach me your decrees. You have done many good things for me, Lord, just as you promised. I believe in your commands. Now teach me good judgment and knowledge. I used to wander off until you disciplined me, but now I have closely followed your word. You are good and do only good. Teach me your decrees. Arrogant people smear me with lies, but in truth I obey your commandments with all my heart. Their hearts are dull and stupid, but I delight in your instructions. My suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Your instructions are more valuable to me than millions in gold and silver. Amen. Now let's continue with the call to worship. Your instruction, O Lord, is more valuable than gold or silver. Teach us your decrees. You have done such good things for us. O Lord, your unfailing love fills the earth. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Trust in 
To trust and obey But we never can prove The delights of His love Until all on the altar we lay For the favor He shows For the joy He bestows Are for them who will trust and obey Trust and obey For there's no other way To be happy in Jesus But to trust and obey Let us pray. Oh God, we continue our journey through the season of Lent as we have now come to the second Sunday of Lent. We continue this season of repentance, this season of self-examination, this season of silence and this season of waiting for the leading of your Holy Spirit. We ask that through your Holy Spirit, please lead us into the temptations of Jesus, 40 days in the wilderness where our lives are laid bare and we come face to face with our desires for power power over our lives and the lives of our friends and enemies and maybe even power over you. Open us to your grace and mercy, your love and provision as we confront temptations, the demons that try to run our world and our lives. Give us the power to fight through the powers of sin 
the forces of selfishness and pride, the forces that keep us from confronting the truth about our lives in the world. May we also resist the temptation to find our rest in places that muffle the cries of injustice, the desperation of the needy, the angry of the wronged, and the despair of the hopeless. May those voices echo in our Lenten silence, for the call of your spirit also speaks through those voices. May we use the season of Lent to empty ourselves of all that makes us deaf to the word of God, Jesus Christ, who's already in our hearts. And finally, oh God, during the season of Lent, save us from ourselves and open us to the new life of your Holy Spirit, a life of faith, hope, and love. And as we let your spirit lead us into repentance, may we discover the goodness and fullness of life in your kingdom of peace. In the words of the psalmist, may we find in your presence a refuge, a dwelling place, a place of rest. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We have some announcements today. Um, <laughs> there are to-go lunches. Uh, a, a couple days ago, I wasn't sure. Uh, we were hit pretty hard Friday with folks. Folks outside getting free lunches, folks down, coming downstairs getting free clothes. Food for the Journey had no leftover lunches to give us. <laughs> so I went home and told my sister this. <laughs> Excuse me. She says, what are you going to do? I said, I guess we won't hand out lunches. She says, you can't do that. So my sister, you see, you know, sometimes I say we have leftover stuff in addition to the lunches that Food for the Journey gives us. And sometimes we still have leftover stuff after everyone leaves on Sunday. And so one Sunday, I don't know, a month or two ago, we had this leftover, what they call chicken salad. So I took it home, put it in a freezer. And my sister says, I can do something with that. So we have lunches to hand out. And it will be, um, so she took that chicken salad and, and um, doctored it up some and said, mm, this is very good. So we, you have lunches if you want to take some lunches home now. They are um, chicken salad wraps. I'm kind of small, but she said that tasted pretty good. I, didn't, I have not had one of those yet. Um, so we do have lunches to go. You can eat them cold or hot. Um, the, it's, it's, it's a chicken salad that can be eaten hot or cold. And I found some leftover uh, chips from youth events and some other stuff. So you can eat we have some lunches to distribute today. Uh, thanks to my uh, wonderful sister, my partner in crime, and other things as well. <laughs> um, we do have lunches to hand out. And the Food for Your Journey did provide some other things left over. We have some, um, um, some vegetable dip, some, a couple of containers of some salsa, and some little bags of cauli raw cauliflower then you can use to dip. Um, some things of uh, raspberries, fresh raspberries. Where do you get fresh raspberries these days? I don't know. Anyway, some miscellaneous things come down and then uh, see if you want some some of these, some leftover breakfast of the cinnamon rolls and, and et cetera, hard boiled eggs. Come down and see what food you, is there that you might want to take with you. As always, if you're not sure what's going on in uh, the life of this congregation, check our website, eastdatonfellowship.org. Uh, and uh, see me if you want to get added to the phone list of reminders. Um, we do have breakfast every Sunday morning, 9 to 9.45. Please join us if you, if you can. Uh, if you want to uh, be a participant in helping see if that happens, let me know. Fridays, as I just said, we are here on Fridays. Um, food for the Journey folks preparing lunches, and we uh, provide a uh, free clothing and other things that, that people have donated to us. If you would like to volunteer, show up between 11 and one. You can have some inside work, outside work. I'll give you something to do. You can just sit around and talk to people. Mike does an awesome job at talking to people. Um, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a wonderful talk, or a wonderful task. So um, we have all kinds of uh, roles that you can fill. 
Men's Fellowship is, uh, we'll be meeting again this month of uh, donuts and coffee in addition to their partnering in prayer. Uh, partnering in prayer is, a per is their main purpose, uh, but sure, throw in some donuts and coffee. Why not? Especially at 8 o'clock, 8.30 on a Saturday morning. More, pa really holy. More okay. power to you men. <laughs> 8 30 saturday morning on march 19th which i have no idea when that is this is coming oh, saturday yeah. okay this coming saturday now show up if you're a guy and you want to see what this is about and have some coffee and donuts um so a week from today we have our next all kids event it'll be after church here in the uh, downstairs uh, so we provide lunch it's noon to 12 we provide lunch, and this I basically say it's open to all school age kids. We'll provide lunch, uh, a God story, and we are going to paint rocks. And we're going to distribute those rocks throughout the neighborhood, lay them around so that people can find them. So the rocks will have positive messages or, or a positive picture. So as people walk around the neighborhood, they're going to find these rocks. What they do with those rocks, we cannot control what they do with the rocks. They can keep them there for another person. They can take them home. We cannot control what they do with the rocks. Hopefully it will brighten someone's day. Um, so uh, if you have any school age kids, come and um, uh, they can in, and, uh, participate in that. And uh, another, I think the last announcement, I think that is, yeah. The last announcement I have is, is uh, Dolores, who uh, often sits up here. She is on the, actually she's joining us by phone. But we have a sign-up sheet. Um, if you would like to be a person who stops by Dolores's place and and to visit her, as well as if you've just finished your meal and have some leftovers, take take some food with you to, for, to share with her. If you would like to do that and sign up, there's a sign-up sheet. Um, as well, if you would occasionally then like to clean, if you could maybe are we starring that? Is that what we're doing? Yeah. So, there's a little box that you can check if you would occasionally be willing to help clean her house. Uh, I mean, she's there by herself with maybe a cat, so it's, you know, not, not every week, definitely, but occasionally. She, she, Becca? She eats the food, but she, and the help with cleaning, but she really needs some of the talks too, and visit with her, so that's... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the main, the main need is the need for company and to talk to. The food is definitely appreciated, um, but um, so yeah, uh, there's sign-up sheet going around. If you don't get it during this uh, this uh, time, uh, to see back about that uh, for doing that. <coughs> mm -hmm. Finally, we move now to our offertory offering time, where you have the opportunity to be a participant in this worship service. You can offer up a prayer. Um, you can write down a prayer if you want on the card that's in the back of the pew and place that in, in the offering plate as your gift to God. Uh, you can give a financial gift or you can just give a nonverbal prayer in your own heart to God during this time. We are a community of people who want to follow Jesus and Sometimes we struggle in our work and, and carrying out this work of Jesus, but we are able to find joy in the Lord and joy in the life we share together. And so now we are taking up offerings uh, so that others may find that same joy. Let us pray for these offerings we are about to receive. Oh God, you are the maker of heaven and earth. So accept the tithes and offerings we are about to gather. May our sincere desire to be faithful stewards bring joy to your heart. And may our willingness to share through your blessing make these offerings become a source of hope and love in this church family and the community behind beyond us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the ushers come forward, please.
In a world where we're losing hope And life has us on the ropes Misunderstandings, hate running rampant Every man out for his own It seems like we've lost our way And the distance grows every day Thought that we had it, caught in the madness Oh, ain't it tragic, but you said If we turn from our wicked ways And humble ourselves in pray, You'd seek your face, you'd give us grace So come have your way, Lord Here we are, abandoned hearts On bending knees with outstretched arms God, hear us from heaven Send us your prayers Trust the Creator, He's perfect in nature, better is coming, I know. Just like the rising sun, our faith is rising up. You're the God of your promise and what you have started. You're faithful to finish because you said, if we turn from our wicked ways, and humbled ourselves in praise. And seek your face, you'd give us grace So come have your way, God Here we are, abandoned hearts Abandoned knees with outstretched arms God, hear us from heaven Send us your prayers We need you, Lord We need you, Lord church pretty powerful song talking about kingdom come and look at what's happening in the world and we pray may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and god come soon
So let's read Leviticus together. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up with the harvester's drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines. Do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not bring shame on the name of your God by using it to swear falsely. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not twist justice and legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stay in idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Today we, in, in a little while, when we come to sermon time, we'll be finishing up um, a sermon series on the way. And the service up till now, the passages we've had read and the songs that we've sung have tied together with those thoughts. You know, we heard just now, as a brother guy, my dad was reading from Leviticus, part of the way that God says, this is how I want it. I don't want people to make the blind stumble or to mock the deaf. And I don't want people to take advantage of hired workers. And, and, I, don't, and, I, and I don't want a people who doesn't care about the poor and the foreigners living among them, but I want you to provide a way for the poor and the foreigners to get what they need. And, and, and God tells us what he wants from a people, what he wants from us. And in that song that we sang before that, we heard the words of the prophet Jeremiah set to music. Most of the words from that song, especially the refrain, came straight from the Bible, from the prophet Jeremiah. And, 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 and Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He wept over the people of Israel who had abandoned the ways of God and the instructions of Leviticus. And they took advantage of the poor and they mistreated the foreigners in their midst. And, and, and they, they put those stumbling blocks in front of the blind. And, and Jeremiah wept over them and he said, but you can be healed if you will. Humble yourself and get on your knees and pray with all your heart as you seek the Lord. And he will restore you. If only you would do that. If only you would repent. If only you would listen to the way. We have come here this morning to listen to the voice of God telling us about this beautiful, wonderful way that he has given us to live in this world. And we have come to receive from him spiritual power to walk that way, a way that we can't walk apart from his help, but with his help, we can absolutely walk each and every day. And walking that way, we can shine with the glory and the grace of heaven on earth and be a light to others. May God grant that we do that. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, we've come to the sermon time. And I have a special request of the ushers real quick. Up here on the piano, uh, there are some uh, outlines uh, that I would like distributed to the congregation. Adam and Mike, could you make sure that those get to everybody real quick? I'm surprising them with this, uh, with this task. Um, I should have talked to you guys first. Um, what they are going to pass around is uh, an outline 
of the contents of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I am sure that most of us have probably heard of it before. If you've not, that's okay. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount was a sermon on a mount. <laughs> uh, it's not too hard to understand. Jesus preached it. It can be found in the book of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7. And it is the longest extended preaching of Jesus that we have in the Gospels. Uh, and it is of, we can't even calculate how important and beautiful and good and central this sermon is to learning the way. We've talked about the way of Jesus in, in lots of different ways in these sermons, in this series. All of it in some way leads up to today. Now, we could preach a year on the Sermon on the Mount. We could take one verse at a time and preach sermons. I don't propose to do that. I propose rather today to kind of give you an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, to its structure and its major themes. And then what I'm inviting you to do this week and maybe in weeks to come, but, but this week, here's my challenge. I challenge you to read the Sermon on the Mount this week, to read it in its entirety, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters. If you're a person that struggles a little bit to read and pay attention, just reading it once this week will be a great challenge for you. If reading is a little easier for you, I challenge you to read it once a day. If, if you're a decent reader, it won't take you that long to read these three chapters of the Bible and reading, reading them once each day over the coming week. Whether you're reading it once this week or once a day this week, I want to challenge you to study it. To get out pen and paper when you read it and to make notes as your master, Jesus Christ, teaches you this week the way he wants you to walk. Your notes could be in the form of questions that you have. That's really good. I don't have all the answers. I don't fully understand Jesus. He's my teacher as much as he is yours. And if I already knew everything he had to teach, he wouldn't be my teacher. No, I constantly need Jesus to be my teacher. So questions are great as you, as you study the Sermon on the Mount. Um, insights are great. And in particular, if you're reading the whole sermon, making connections between different parts of the Sermon on the Mount is important. In my sermon today, on Jesus' sermon, I'm going to draw a couple connections between a couple different parts. But there are just so many other connections you could find as you read the Sermon on the Mount. If I put that together with, the, with what he says here in chapter 6, that's an interesting point, right? Oh, that's it, right? What Jesus says about forgiveness at different points. Uh, what Jesus says about judgment and discernment at different points. What Jesus says about, you know, and so just find those connections. Study your master's teachings. So I'm only going to preach this one sermon on the Sermon on the Mount as part of this series. It's the final sermon in the series. But it's an invitation. It's an open door for you to go deeper in, in, in this teaching of Jesus. Because there's a lot more to say about this sermon than I can say in this sermon. <laughs> if, you, if you get my drift. All right, so um, we want to uh, start uh, quickly by, I, I want to lay out for you, which you now have in front of you, this, this outline. I want to lay out for you the basic shape of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if, if, if you plan ahead a little bit, sermons typically have some structure. So I, I have some structure because I do have these PowerPoints. I think ahead a little bit, I plan ahead. And I say, okay, these are the points I want to make. Well, Jesus, of course, was the best preacher there ever was. And there's structure to his Sermon on the Mount. It, now, of course, if you study this, you might be able to come up with a different way of organizing things. All right, but, but I'm going to share with you a common way of thinking about the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. It can be broken down into five parts. Part one is uh, from 5.3 to 16 and talks about who we are as the community of disciples, because he preached this sermon to his disciples. There was a big crowd around him, and he fed that crowd, but then he goes up the mount. Sermon on the mount, he goes up the mount, and the crowd stays down low. Who follows him to hear the sermon? His disciples do. 
So this is a sermon that he, it's not an evangelistic sermon where he's calling people to become his disciples. This is two disciples telling them, here's how I want you to live. That's important to understand the sermon. And so he's, he says, okay, disciples, who are you? And he says, you're blessed because you're poor <laughs> and you're hungry for righteousness. These are the famous beatitudes, right? So he tells us, here's what true blessing is. And then right after he's done talking about what true blessing is, he says, and I want you to be a blessing. I want you to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. He looks at his disciples. He looks at you and me and says, you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And he says, because you're the light of the world, you need to let your good works shine out for all to see so that this world will be lit up. End part one. And then for the rest of chapter five, Jesus lays out what are the good works that we are meant to do that will shine out and will illuminate the world around us. And in this section, Jesus begins with an introduction that says, everything I'm about to teach you, the good way that I'm about to show you to do, the things I want you to do publicly, visibly, I want other people to see you doing this stuff. These actions are fulfillments of the law. Now you might think otherwise because they're gonna sound kind of new and even contradictory when you compare them to the law, but they're not, they fulfill the law. They, they fulfill God's Old Testament instructions, like in the book of Leviticus that we read. And then Jesus gives six of those things. And each of the six, he gives in a particular way. He will say this phrase. He says it six times. He says, you have heard that it was said, blah, 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 blah. But I say to you, blah, 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 blah. Most of what he is quoting is from the law. For instance, the first one, you, I think it's the first one, he says, uh, uh, you've heard that it said that you shall not murder. I don't actually think it is the first one. But he says, you've heard that it said thou shalt not murder, right? That's one of the Ten Commandments that's in the Old Testament. But I say to you, don't even be angry with or curse at a brother or sister. Right? So he's taking something from the law, you've heard that it was said, and he's getting to the heart of what it's really about. Then he sums that whole section up by saying, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, which is a big, big instruction. Be like God. And I've just told you how to do it. And I will give you the power to do it. Because of course, after Jesus dies and is resurrected, he sends us the Holy Spirit. And it is only by the Holy Spirit's presence in your life and by his power that you can live this way. You can't hope to do this stuff without divine power at work in your heart and life. In the third section of the sermon, he moves from talking about, I want you to do these good works and I want you to let them shine. Nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a basket to hide it. I want people to see you doing this stuff. But in the third section, he says, here's some stuff I want you to do, and I don't want to see anybody seeing you do it. I want you to do this stuff, but I want you to do it quietly and secretly. This is not for you to show other people. This is not for you to do out loud or publicly. You need to do it, but you need to do it privately. And he gives us three of those things, which I'll mention in a minute. In the fourth section, he begins to give us very practical advice about how to live on this fallen planet Earth. He talks about money and how we ought to treat money. He talks about how we are to use our eyes. Where do we look? What do we pay attention to in this world? He talks about worry and planning. He talks about that practical stuff. How do I live this earthly life? And then in the last section, you're given a, a kind of quick rat-a-tat series of summaries of his teaching and concluding remarks. He talks about how the way is narrow and hard, but worth following. He, 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 he gives us the golden rule that sums up what, how we're to treat other people. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? He, he talks about um, uh, how, how to be able to tell um, when another person 
is speaking the truth about God. He says, look to their fruit. Look to what they do. And finally, he says, the person who hears my teaching and doesn't live it is like a person who builds their house on sand. And the first time the storm comes in, the house clatters down. But the person who listens to my teaching and does it, who lives it, they're like a person who dug deep down into the rock to lay the foundation of their home. And whatever storms may come, the house shall stand. And if you and I take Jesus seriously as a teacher, then we ought to listen to him and do what he says. And that's why I am challenging you today to study the Sermon on the Mount this week and to see what Jesus wants to say to you. Yes? This all be found in the book of Matthew, right? Book of Matthew, chapter 5 to chapter 7. Those three chapters. Absolutely. All right. So... As an example of the sort of things you may be able to find in the Sermon on the Mount as you study it for yourself, I want to pay attention to this list of public works and private practices that Jesus has in the sermon. Uh, we can't slow down to look at each one. Each one of these could be a sermon. This is an overview. This, this sermon is a lot more teachy than preachy. Uh, there's a difference in that, and if you're interested, we can talk about that. This is really a, a teaching session this morning. But let me, let me talk about these six uh, practices that Jesus says, I do want people to see you doing this. This should be done publicly. He has six of them, okay? Um, and in, so the, like I said, we're going fast. Uh, but you can, it, this week, you have a whole week to study this stuff. So you can drill down, right? But these, these, this can be found in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, starting in verse 21, okay, these practices. He says, right, uh, you've heard it said, oh, this, murder was the first one. You've heard that it said, you know, you all, thou shalt not kill, but I say to you, don't even be angry or curse another. Um, it, uh, instead, you were to reply in gentleness. We're to avoid anger and cursing. We're to practice, positively stated, positively stated, we're to practice peaceableness. God's will for you is that you would be known as a person of peace. That you would be known as a person who has control of their temper and can respond with gentleness to aggression. That you would not curse others, but bless them. That you would bless them even if they curse you. And that's, guys, that's in here. Like, I'm not making this up. Jesus says, if someone curses you and yells at you and screams at you, the response he wants us to be able to give is to bless him. God bless you. The second practice, Jesus says, you've heard that it was uh, said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even look with somebody uh, with lust in your heart. We're to positively stated, we're to practice chastity. It's an old fashioned word, I know, but it's a good word. We're to be known as a people who keep ourselves um, reserved for God and who treat our bodies as the holy and beautiful gifts they are. That we don't treat sex as entertainment. And we don't treat other people as objects. But instead, we know that sex is something holy and good, and it's a gift. And it's a gift that God has reserved for the special context of marriage. Our world is awash in sex as a product. Certainly it's awash in pornography, but it's also awash just in the media in, in a cheapening display of sexuality as entertainment. And Jesus says, sex may sell, but you aren't buying. <laughs> if you're my disciple, I don't want you buying. It's not a thing to be bought and sold. Jesus says, uh, uh, you've heard that it was said, you have to keep the vows you make. Oh, I'm skipping one. Let me back up. Jesus, uh, you, you've heard that it was said um, uh, that if you're going to divorce, make sure you get the, the paper signed. But you can divorce for any reason you want. Jesus says, I know that, that you've heard that, but you are not to do it. You are to be committed. 
Now, he, he actually, Jesus talks about cases of unfaithfulness where uh, divorce uh, would, would not uh, involve sin. And he, and he also, this is really key, even where something is sinful, Jesus preaches grace. So even where there has been divorce, there is still grace. God doesn't cut people off. Many of us have experienced divorce. I know many of you have. But what Jesus is commending to us positively going forward is that we would practice commitment, that we would be known as a people who are committed, that we would not treat the marriage commitment or any other commitment lightly, that it can just be gotten out of as long as you get the right paperwork filled, that we would be a committed people. Then he says, you've heard that it was said, um, just keep, keep the vows you make. Jesus says, don't make vows. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Which basically he says, if you're always honest, you never need to make a vow. If you always mean what you say, you never have to go, I, I promise you I'm really going to do this. If you always do what you say. Jesus wants, and remember, these are all to be public. Jesus wants you and I to be known as people who always do what they say. Oh, yeah, they're one of those Jesus followers. They're one of his disciples. They always do what they say. If they said it, you can take it to the bank, baby. That's, he wants his people to be known that way. Um, then he says, um, you have heard uh, that it was said you should love your neighbor but uh, um, hate your enemy. Um, and, and Jesus says, no, you're even to love your enemies. Um, and in the context of discussing that, uh, I'm kind of doing some things out of order here, guys. Sorry. In the context of discussing that, well, I'll just take you to this place real quick in Matthew 5. He, he says, um, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer them the other also. If you're sued in court and your shirt gets taken from you, give your coat to. If a soldier demands that you carry gear for a mile, carry it two miles. So if, if people attack you in some way. Jesus says, do not resist. Practice, the term for this is non-resistance, that we would give good where we get evil. That's the principle. People may give us evil and do evil against us, but we're to practice good back to them, not to meet evil with evil, not to meet force with force. And similarly, if people try to take stuff from us, Jesus says, don't, okay, they want to they take your uh, uh, coat from you, then go ahead and take your shirt off while you're at it and let them have that too. Practice radical generosity, which leads finally to that idea of love for enemies. Now, these six things... Again, we're flying here, but I'm going to make some bigger points and bigger connections. These six are to be done publicly. You, you are to be seen to be a peaceable, chaste, committed, honest person who does not resist but gives good for evil, who's radically generous, and who is universally loving. You love everybody. That's what he wants you to be. By his power, he can make you that way. You really, you can be this person. By God, a little bit more every day, not overnight, but a little bit more every day by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can become like this. That's cool, right? And you'll be seen to be this way. Being this way will redound to the reputation of your Lord, Jesus Christ. But right after this section, Jesus says that there are some things that he wants us to do that he doesn't want other people noticing we do. The um, prior list, Jesus calls them good works. Uh, kala erga in the original Greek. In your English translation, it might use the same phrase. It might call them good works. Uh, I know that in the NLT, the translation I read from uh, in church, that it does that. But actually, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus talks about these private practices, he doesn't call them with that terminology. He doesn't say kala erga. He doesn't say good works. He says something else. He calls these practicing righteousness. And he says you aren't to practice your righteousness in public. There's three of them that we're to do privately. We are to give to the needy in private. So he wants you and I to give to needy people. 
to help people that don't have enough. And he wants you and I to do that without calling attention to ourselves and to what we're doing. In fact, Jesus famously says, when you do this, make sure that your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. <laughs> it's a lovely, lovely image, right? We are to do it, but we are not to make a big deal of it. Not to the person we're giving to and not to others. We're tempted sometimes to think about how good we are and to, and to let other people know subtly, indirectly, or sometimes loudly, look at, what, look at how generous I've been. But Jesus says, no, 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 do it quietly. God will reward you for what's done in quiet. If you get credit for it on earth, that's all the reward you're going to get. And certainly don't seek a bunch of credit from, from the person that you're giving to. Hey, if you can give secretly to them, do that. Give anonymously. Then Jesus says a bunch about, he has a lot of teaching in, in chapter six about prayer. Now, of course, we're to pray together as a church, but he, he's here talking about your private prayer practice. And he does want his disciples praying on their own. And he says, when you do this, go into your closet. He uses that word. He goes, says, go into your closet, close the door so no one can see you and get down on your knees and talk to your Abba Father. Because he hears everything uttered in secret. And it's about him. It's not about other people. It's not about being noticed. It's not about getting credit because you're so holy. I pray an hour a day. Okay. <laughs> Jesus says, be quiet about it. <laughs> if you pray an hour a day, that's lovely. But the point is to talk to your Heavenly Father, not to be able to brag to other Christians about your prayer practices. So pray, brothers and sisters. Jesus tells us, but reserve that as a special time for you and God. Because if you don't do that, if you, if you seek kind of credit for it, if you kind of brag on it, if you do it to get noticed by others, if you do it because you want attention, you're treating God as some kind of object you can take advantage of. God wants you to care about him because he cares about you. And prayer time is with him. It's not about anybody else. And you need time with your father. You need time with your father. And the last, oh, and by the way, in that Jesus talks about how important it is to forgive uh, when you pray and to pray as you forgive and to pray about forgiveness. There's tons in this sermon, guys. We're flying, but I'm, I'm trying to draw some bigger pictures for you. Last one is fasting. The last of the private practices. He says, yeah, and you need to be fasting. You need to be giving to the poor. You need to be uh, praying on your own and you need to be fasting as a regular practice in your life. But that fasting is also supposed to be done in secret. If you go around moaning about, oh, I've given up so much for God this Lent. I have uh, sacrificed the following things. Um, again, Jesus says, okay, well, you will get other people to applaud you, but that's all the reward you're going to get. Your fasting will have no spiritual benefit. But if when you fast, he, Jesus actually has this cool image where he says, slick back your hair with oil, put a comb through the thing, walk out with a smile on your face. Don't let anybody know you're doing anything hard um, because your father, again, he repeats himself, he sees what's in secret. And there will be a spiritual reward and a spiritual benefit from a fast that you undertake in, in, in private. Now, I want to I draw your attention to one last thing that I think pulls together these two lists, the, the public works we're supposed to do and the private works we're supposed to do. One to be seen, the other not to be seen. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has words for us about judgment and discernment. He says, do not judge unless you be judged. But he also says things like this. Do not throw pearls to pigs. Be careful with whom you speak. And there, the idea is that, that if you have something really holy and beautiful to share, you need to be able to discern who you're sharing it with. Because there are piggy people in the world <laughs> that aren't ready for those pearls. And if you share it, you might just be sorry you did, because all they're going to do is trample it. And Jesus says, don't, don't throw your pearls to pigs. Be discerning. 
And so there's a difference between judgment and discernment, right? Judgment is when you dismiss a person as a person. It's when you condemn them in your own head and heart and write them off. But discernment is the ability to say about a situation or a person, yeah, I need to put some distance between me and them, or I need to not listen to what they're saying because what they're saying is not good, right? So Jesus has a lot to say about that in the course of the sermon. One of the things he says is this, beware of, I keep pointing this way because I see the screen. Uh, what you see on the screen, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. Now, here's a connection I want you to see between what we've, we've been looking at today. Jesus says that you can identify a true prophet and a, somebody who's really speaking with the heart of God by observing the works they're doing publicly. Which works? Imagine you know someone who maybe is a relatively wealthy member of a, of a big congregation. And they make big donations publicly to public causes. Maybe they even put their names on buildings. Have you ever seen like, you know, this so-and-so's medical center or whatever, name for whoever gave the big donation, right? And so this person is known. They, oh my gosh, we all know they are so generous. They give so much money to these causes. And, um, and, and maybe they're a person that's rather loud about the need for righteousness and holiness. And they let you know what their spiritual practices are. And they're very committed to them. And they're very loud and noisy about those that aren't committed to those spiritual practices, right? Well, those things that they're doing so publicly are precisely the things Jesus said he, his followers ought not to do publicly. And maybe they're missing some of the key fruits Jesus said should be public. When they speak with others, are they peaceable? Or when these outwardly generous people speak loudly about what they say is holy, do they speak in judgment and condemning others? Do they speak with anger in their voice? Do they speak with a sense of righteous indignation and fury at other people, condemning them and, and, and calling down things upon them, using epithets, calling them names. Jesus says in this sermon that if you call a brother or sister by a name, if you curse them, if you say rock at them, which means fool or idiot, that just that much you're in, the da in danger of the fires of hell. Brothers and sisters, I have listened to sermons preached by people who have lots of money and have publicly given lots of money. And they call people worse than idiots in those sermons. And they say that they're fighting a war and they know who the enemies are. Such people evince the fruits Jesus says should be private and they lack the fruits he says should be public. And so we have to be discerning not to throw pearls to pigs. And so this simple instruction, you can tell the, the, who are the, 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 the false uh, sheep and who are the true by their fruit. That simple saying in chapter 7 is enriched when we keep in mind the two different lists. Jesus says, here's the fruit you should be able to see, and here's the fruit you should not be able to see, because you should be keeping that quiet. And so if you read the whole sermon, and you read the list of the public fruit in chapter five and the private fruit in chapter six, then when you get to chapter seven and it says you can tell them by their fruit, you see how it builds on itself and you actually get a deeper wisdom when you read the whole sermon together? That is what I'm inviting you to do this week. Read the whole sermon, Jesus's own sermon. I mean, we flew through just a few parts of it and I'm sorry to put you through that. <laughs> I know we covered a lot. But the point of this sermon is really to get you doing this this week. Dig into what your Savior has to teach this week. And let him teach you the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have sent us your Son to be our Savior, to be our teacher and Lord, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father and Son, for sending your Spirit to us. 
because we would have no hope of living this way were it not for your Holy Spirit's power and presence in our hearts. Help us, Lord, to live for you, to love you, to love our neighbors, and to even love our enemies. Help us to trust and obey, to obey even the instructions that we know are divine, that are beyond our human capacity, when struck on one cheek to turn the other, when stolen from to give more to the thief than they even thought to take, when cursed to bless, to be generous with the need, to pray often, to discipline our bodies with the gift of fasting, to follow after you. Lord, we want to be a people who is known for peaceableness, chastity, commitment, honesty, non-resistance, generosity, and love. We're hungry and we're thirsty for that righteousness, Lord. May each one of us grow in those practices this very week, as we together dive into your great sermon. We pray it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and worship God through this last song. We have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. Brothers and sisters, as you go from this place and as you dig into his word this week, may you be preserved from the attacks of Satan. May your shepherd guard your right and your left hand. May he lead you forward and protect you from behind, that you may never turn back, but follow along his way one more step every day until you arrive at glory. Amen. And go in peace.